This is going to be Titus chapter 3, and we're going to look at some things every Bible believer should remember. Number one, we should remember to be ready to work. Titus 3 1 says, Put them in mind to be subject to principalities and powers, to obey magistrates, to be ready to every good work. And the principalities and powers in verse 1 can't be the spiritual principalities and powers in Ephesians 6 because it says to be subject to them. But there are some people in authority on earth, the principalities and powers and magistrates, that we need to be sub subjecting to them. If you look at Romans 13 in verse 1, it says, Let every soul be subject unto the higher powers, for there is no power but of God. The powers that be are ordained of God. So a Christian is to go by the law of the land, as long as it doesn't go against God's laws. You are to be under the authority of your parents, your teachers, police officers, as long as what they're telling you doesn't go against God's laws. And now, in America, they're allowing things, some things aren't against the law, that are against God's laws. And just because something here isn't against the law doesn't mean it's not against God's laws. Just because it's not against the law for homosexuals to, to get married doesn't mean you should marry the same sex. Just because in some places it's okay for you to smoke marijuana doesn't mean you should smoke marijuana. But we need to be, obey God's laws, obey man's laws, when they don't cross God's laws. And being under authority and accepting the fact that you aren't in charge of everything is a step in the right direction towards being ready to every good work. When you obey the authority that God has put in your life, then you are also obeying God. When you obey your parents, when they tell you to do the right thing, you're obeying God. The music today is geared towards getting kids away from obeying their parents. They'll even say to disobey your parents in, in the songs. We're saved by believing the gospel, and we're saved by putting our trust in the Lord Jesus Christ and His finished work on the cross, but we also need to have good works. Not good works to get saved or to stay saved, or for the purpose of showing someone we have a changed life, but we need to have the good works because it's pleasing to God and we love God and just because He says we need to do it. And in the very same chapter we're studying, in Titus chapter 3, Paul says in verse 8, This is a faithful saying, And these things I will that thou affirm constantly, that they which have believed in God might be careful to maintain good works. These things are good and profitable unto men. And notice the key word maintain. You see a lot of people who get saved and they live right for a while, and they do some things for the Lord for a while, but they don't maintain the good works. They go back to living like they did before. And the Christian should be consistently doing good works for God. Titus 3.14 says, Let ours also learn to maintain good works for necessary uses, that they be not unfruitful. So maintain good works. Be fruitful for God. So, number one, every Bible believer needs to remember to be ready to every good work. And number two, Remember, running your mouth doesn't help anything. Titus 3 2 says to speak evil of no man, to be no brawlers, but gentle, showing all meekness unto all men. In 2018, it's not a strange thing to hear one Christian lie and slander about another Christian. The verse said, Speak evil of no man. Now, this obviously can't mean that you can't expose a false teacher, because Paul rebuked Alexander the coppersmith. He said, Demas hath forsaken me. He, he spake against Hymenaeus, and John spoke against Diotrephes. Jesus Christ spoke against the Pharisees. So it's not evil to speak against the evil of another man. And you speak evil of a man when you lie and slander him to prove your point. Something you need to remember is running your mouth doesn't help. And when a preacher gets up and lies about another preacher, he is helping no one. It doesn't edify anyone. And you'll just make the people as ugly and mean-spirited as you are if all you do when you get behind the pulpit is bad mouth, everyone that doesn't agree with you. Uh, the verse said in uh, Titus 3, 2, to be no brawlers. And if you don't speak, speak evil of another man, there will be less chances that a fight would even take place. 
you, you hear a lot of these preachers now talking about fighting each other. That's what it's come to. A soft answer turns away wrath. When you speak contentiously, this opens the door for a fight. The verse said to be gentle. Many Christians aren't gentle at all. They say what's on their mind. They say, well, I'm just going to say what's on my mind. But this is wrong. They have no filter on their mouth, and they have no understanding when it comes to knowing how to deal with someone else. You don't just say what's on your mind. Really, you shouldn't say something unless about somebody unless it just absolutely needs to be said or if, unless it's something nice about somebody. So be ready to every good work. Remember that running your mouth doesn't help anybody. And next, remember where you used to be. In Titus 3.3, 3, it says, For we ourselves also were sometimes foolish, disobedient, deceived, serving diverse lusts and pleasures, living in malice and envy, hateful and hating one another. Remember where you used to be. You also acted like a fool. How many foolish things did you do as a kid or a teenager growing up? Uh, maybe you are older and not a babe in Christ anymore, but don't forget where God brought you from. And if you remember where you used to be, then it will help you deal with others who are, are presently where you used to be. There's some Christians who just got saved and they're still listening to contemporary Christian music. They're still using the new Bibles. Maybe they don't understand that's wrong yet. Maybe they're ignorant on the issue. Maybe they're still listening to secular music. Maybe they're still watching bad movies they're not supposed to watch. You need to be patient with other people and remember where it used to be. Most likely you were worse than they were. You were sometimes disobedient. You walked according to the course of this world, according to the prince of the power of the air, the spirit that now worketh in all the children of disobedience. You were sometimes deceived, as it says in Titus 3.3. 3. And the God of this world had blinded your mind to the glorious gospel. You served out verse lusts and pleasures. You lived for the flesh. And all you thought about was sleeping and eating and drinking and fornicating and playing Xbox and PlayStation 4 and doing everything you weren't supposed to do. You just cared about your own entertainment. So don't be so shocked when the lost world does the same thing that you used to do. That's where you used to be. Titus 3.3 also talks about how you used to live in malice and envy. You hated and envied so much that you were full of malice. You wanted to inflict pain on them because you were so envious and hateful towards people. And a good example of this is Saul going after David. You were hateful and hated other people. So don't be surprised when you see a lost sinner hate you because you show them their wicked deeds just by living a Christian life, by having a Bible in your hand. Remember that the world hated Jesus Christ before it hated you. And as Christians, we need to put off all of those bad things. We need to put off all the works of the flesh. Something that will drive away your foolishness is the foolishness of preaching. 1 Corinthians one twenty one says, For after that in the wisdom of God, the world by wisdom knew not God. It pleased God by the foolishness of preaching to save them that believe. What will cure your disobedience? A good response to God's chastening. Hebrews 12.8 says, But if you be without chastisement, whereof all are partakers, then ye, are you bastards and not sons. If you learn from the chastening hand of God, then you're not going to be as disobedient as you were before it happened. What will help you be not deceived? Read the Pauline epistles and study every time he says be not deceived. Get your doctrine straight. If you know the right doctrine, then you'll know the wrong doctrine when you see it. How do you cure the desire to serve diverse lusts and pleasures? Quit thinking about yourself and help somebody else. Quit thinking about what you're going to do when you get home from school or when you get off from work or when you wake up in the morning. How you're going to satisfy your flesh and try to think about satisfying someone else. Try to think about a lost soul. Philippians 2.3 says, Let nothing be done through strife or vainglory. Vain glory. But in the lowliness of mind, let each esteem other better than themselves. If you want to quit living in malice and envy, hateful and hating one another, then you need to realize that God is the one who gets the glory and not yourself. You have malice and envy and hate because someone is getting the recognition that you want. 
If you want to be happy, then quit living for yourself. Live for other people and live for God. But next, another thing every Bible believer should realize is that your righteousness is filthy rags. Titus 3, 4 through 5 says, But after the kindness and love of God our Savior toward man appeared, not by works of righteousness which we have done, but according to His mercy He saved us by the washing of regeneration and renewing of the Holy Ghost. When you got saved, you saw yourself as a guilty sinner. You knew your righteousness was no good. Then after you started living right and got saved, you became a little bit self-righteous. You need to realize your righteousness is filthy rags, and you weren't saved by works of righteousness, which you've done, but according to His mercy, He saved you. And after talking about how men hate and envy, Paul talks about how God is kind and loves. Notice it says His love was toward man and not just toward the saints. God may hate all the workers of iniquity, but in a way He loved them at the same time. You say, how is that possible? Well, how is it possible for Him to be in more than one place at one time? I can't explain everything about God, but God is not a Calvinist. He doesn't damn some and then save some. He saves anybody that comes to Him. He showed His love toward every man. He showed His love when he died on the cross, and he loves every man through the Lord Jesus Christ and will save any man through Jesus Christ. But there's some people he does hate. He says, I hate all workers of iniquity. He showed his love toward people who are unrighteous. He died to pay for their sins. He paid for our sins. So don't forget that your righteousness is filthy rags, and the only reason that you are going to heaven is because you have the righteousness of Jesus Christ not because of your own self-righteous works that you think you're good, but you're really not. You think you're a big shot, but you're really not. Uh, Romans 10, 3 says, For they being ignorant of God's righteousness and going about to establish their own righteousness have not submitted themselves unto the righteousness of God. So, there's some people out there who they're ignorant of God's righteousness because they go about to establish their own righteousness. By trying to get saved by good works. But we, none of us have righteousness. Any righteousness that we get comes from the Lord Jesus Christ. Romans 3.10 says, As it is written, there is none righteous, no, not one. So you are so unrighteous and filthy. But the Lord gave you the righteousness of Jesus Christ when you got born again. Romans 4.6 says, Even as David also describeth the blessedness of the man unto whom God imputeth righteousness without works. So just imagine that there's a file cabinet in heaven and it's got a folder holding all of your bad works, your adultery, your gossip, your hate, your wicked music you listen to when you listen to Eminem and Katy Perry and Kesha. It's got all the wicked video games you played in it. It's got that wrote down every time you played Grand Theft Auto, every time you played Dante's Inferno. Every time you played Gears of War, every time you played Call of Duty, it's got all that stuff written in it. It's got your malice and envy written in it. Imagine God taking the wicked things out of that folder, all the times you played those bad video games, all the times you got drunk, all the times you smoked pot with your friends, all the times you watched pornography, all the times you fornicated with someone you weren't married to. He took all those bad things out, made it disappear, and then put in the righteousness of Jesus Christ in your folder. And he then seals it up so that no man can put anything in it. No man can take it out and erase some stuff and write some stuff down that's bad on you. The devil can't come in there and write some bad stuff down on you. He can't take anything out of it because it's sealed. You were sealed into the day of redemption. And that is what happened at your salvation. Because it, because it isn't by works of righteousness, which we have done, but according to his mercy, he saved us. It was the mercy of God that you aren't going to hell. And His mercy has to do with Him keeping you from something you deserved. And you deserve to keep all those things in your folder. You deserve to have all your sins stuck on you because He took them away. He took them away. But you deserve to have all, all every single one of your sins stuck to your soul. Titus 3, 5 says, Not by works of righteousness, which we have done, but according to His mercy He saved us, by the washing of regeneration and renewing of the Holy Ghost. So when you are regenerated, when you're born again, you are washed. Your sins are gone. Then the Word of God can continually cleanse you every day. 
The Bible says, Wherewithal shall a young man cleanse his way by taking heed thereto according to thy word. So the Holy Ghost made you new and continues to renew you every day. Second Corinthians 4.16 says, For which cause we faint not, but though our outward man perish, yet the inward man is renewed day by day. So a Bible believer should remember his righteousness as filthy rags and next remember he needs to run to Jesus Christ. When anything bad happens and when things bad aren't happening, when things are going good, you still need to run to Jesus Christ. Titus 3, 6 through 8 says, which he shed on us abundantly through Jesus Christ our Savior. That being justified by his grace, we should be made heirs according to the hope of of eternal life this is a faithful saying and these things i will that will that thou affirm constantly that they which have believed in god might be careful to maintain good works these things are good and profitable unto men anything good that you have came from jesus christ in whom we have redemption through his blood even the forgiveness of sins our salvation is through him and it's only through him that we can have a prayer life with god you can only pray to God because of the Lord Jesus Christ. All of God's mercy and grace is shed on us through Jesus Christ, our Savior. He is our ticket to God and our ticket to heaven. He appeased the wrath of God. He's our ticket out of here at the rapture. And verse 7 says that being justified by His grace, we should be made heirs according to the hope of eternal life. You are justified by His grace. When you believed on the Lord Jesus Christ, you were justified. Just as if you never sinned, you were made an heir through Jesus Christ. Galatians 4, 7 says, Wherefore thou art no more a servant, but a son, and if a son, then an heir of God through Christ. Hebrews 1, 2 says, Hath in these last days spoken us unto us by his Son, whom he, whom he hath appointed heir of all things, but whom also he made the world's. Hebrews 1, 3 through 4 says, Who being the brightness of his glory and the express image of his person and upholding all things by the word of his power, when he had by himself purged our sins, set down on the right hand of the majesty on high, being so much more, being so much better than the angels, as he hath obtained, as he hath by inheritance obtained a more excellent name than they. And you were made an heir through Jesus Christ. We didn't inherit salvation. We got it as a free gift. You don't inherit salvation you guys, as a free gift, but when you get saved, when you get in Christ, then you inherit something. Jesus Christ is going to be the heir of the kingdom. He is going to come back after the seven-year tribulation and bring in his kingdom, and we will also be the heirs and reign over cities. And we are going to have a mansion in eternity. So the moment you got saved, you had an inheritance. Everyone who gets saved has an inheritance. And then if you live right after you get saved, you get even more of an inheritance. And verse 8 says, This is a faithful saying. And these things I will that thou affirm constantly, that they which have believed in God might be careful to maintain good works. These things are good and profitable unto men. And nothing is more profitable for you than for you to run to Jesus Christ. If you are running with Jesus, then you're at agreement with him. How can two walk together except to be agreed? How can you run with Jesus if you don't agree with him? If you're agreed, then you're going to follow what he says in his book. If you follow the book, then you will maintain good works. And these things are a faithful saying. And Paul wants Titus to affirm these things constantly. Some things you have to teach over and over and over and over again. Teach the basics over and over again. You don't want to teach the strange doctrine over again and make a ministry off of the strange doctrine. Even though you need that stuff sometimes, you don't need to be occupied with it. But the th basic things you need to affirm constantly. You mostly want to stick with the basic truths. And a lot of people will just stick with the hardcore meat and the strange stuff. And that just makes you crazy. But if you keep the basic truths in there, it keeps you balanced and it keeps you not being puffed up in knowledge. And Hebrews talks about not being occupied with strange doctrine, as I said. You want to stick with the basic Bible truth. Stick with the main thing. Affirm these things constantly. And they which have believed in God might be careful to maintain good works. If these things are affirmed constantly, then it makes it easier for people to run to Jesus. 
instead of running to their own self, their own knowledge. It makes it easier for them to maintain good works. And these things are good and profitable to men. And there are some things in this life that aren't bad, but they aren't good either. They aren't profitable. Someone may say, well, is it a sin for me to play these video games? Maybe you've got a game which is one out of a hundred that doesn't have anything sinful in it. But is it profitable? Are you spending all your time on a game instead of in the book and talking to Jesus Christ? Is it going to help you spiritually? Or is it going to help someone else? What about your kids? What about your wife? Are you spending all your time playing a video game? As many men are. But next we see every Bible believer should remember to reject heresies and heretics. Titus 3, 9 through 11 says, But avoid foolish questions and genealogies and contentions and strivings about the law, for they are unprofitable and vain. A man that is an heretic after the first and second admonition reject, knowing that he that is such as subverteth and sinneth, being condemned of himself. So avoid foolish questions. When someone says something trying to mock God, like can God create a rock so heavy that he can't lift it? Just avoid it. Avoid foolish questions about the genealogies. Sometimes atheists and Bible correctors will go through those genealogies in the Old Testament and try to point out errors. And they haven't ever proved an error, but they will ask foolish questions about it. Just avoid that stuff. Avoid the contentions. If a preacher only wants to cause trouble and drama and fights and his ministry is one big giant soap opera all the time and it's just drama, then avoid him. Avoid strivings about the law. Are men trying to put you back under the law? Are they saying you have to be baptized in water to be saved? Are they saying you have to keep the Sabbath to be saved or live up to a certain standard to be saved? Then avoid them. These things are unprofitable and vain. They're unprofitable because none of it is certain. You can't bank on it. The foolish questions people have most of the time only cause contention and you can't find a good enough answer for those questions. They won't like any of the answers anyway, so why even give an answer? Contentions are unprofitable. And if a man just gets up and is angry all the time and is bad-mouthing everybody to his congregation, he's not edifying anybody. He's just making himself feel better. It's not profitable. Just preach and teach the Bible, and all the heretics will be rebuked eventually by the word itself if you preach the whole counsel of God. And now verse 10, A man that is an heretic after the first and second admonition reject, knowing that he that is such is subverted and sinneth, being condemned of himself. If a man won't take sound doctrine after the first and second time you tell him, then reject him. I wouldn't spend much time trying to convince a church of Christ leader about sound doctrine. He knows what the Bible says, and he has chosen his mind to reject what the Bible says. So you have to reject him. He is subverted. He's sunk. He's drowning himself. He's resting the scriptures to his own destruction. He's condemned of himself, willingly ignorant of the scriptures. And Titus 3, 2 or Titus three twelve through 15 says, When I shall send Artemis unto thee, or Tychicus, be diligent to come unto me, to Nicopolis, for, that, for I have determined there to win her. So Artemis and Tychicus are going to fill in for Titus when he goes to, to Nicopolis to see Paul. And Paul is staying there for the winter. Then he says, Bring Zenos the lawyer and Apollos on their journey diligently, that nothing be wanting unto them. Just like Luke is a good doctor, Zenos is a good lawyer. Maybe like someone like David Gibbs is a good lawyer today. So there can be good Christian doctors and good Christian lawyers, just like there was in the Bible. Verse 14, And let ours also learn to maintain good works for necessary uses, that they be not unfruitful. Paul once again talks about having good works. We are saved by grace through faith without works, but that doesn't mean we shouldn't strive to maintain good works. Don't be an unfruitful Christian. Don't have good fruits to satisfy the fruit inspector. Have good fruits because you love Jesus Christ and what he did for you. Have, show the fruits of the Spirit. And also show things outwardly so that people can see that you've changed since you were saved. Just because we're not saved by having a changed life doesn't mean you shouldn't show a changed life. Verse 15, all that, are with, all that are with me, salute thee. Greet them that love us in the faith. Grace be with you all. Amen. 
it sounds like Paul enjoys a be being around other people and other Christians. He's talking about saluting and greeting and then saying, Grace be with you all. So it sounds like those Christians who are saying we need to isolate ourselves from everybody, they're dead wrong. But this has been Titus chapter 3 about some things every Bible believer should remember.